Thank you to the organizers of Research Week for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of the research of the Women's Leadership Institute in the College of Liberal Arts. I just want to begin with a little bit of background on this particular project called a gender comparison of HBCUs and PWIs in the Southeast. This project began when we formed the Tuskegee Auburn Women's Leadership Alliance, pictured here at one of our early meetings. We established this alliance to advance women associated with both universities towards equality in leadership. As we began to talk, we started to realize that many of the problems that were preventing women from attaining leadership positions were the same at both types of universities, at both HBCUs and at PWIs. As we talked, we speculated that at historically black colleges and universities and at predominantly white institutions, women are not being hired, promoted, or paid the same as men. So we began some research by looking at numbers that the universities reported themselves to the National Center for Education Statistics between 1980 and 2011. We looked at all 24 doctoral granting land grant institutions in the Southeast, 13 historically black colleges and 11 predominantly white institutions. HBCUs, in case you don't know, are defined as any historically black college that was established prior to 1964, whose main objective is the education of black Americans, while PWIs are defined as institutions where white Americans primarily account for 50% of the student body. And the term also implies exclusion of black Americans prior to 1964 in the historical context of segregation. The 13 HBCUs that we looked at included the usual suspects, Alabama State University, Alabama A&M, Tuskegee University, South Carolina State University. The PWIs, 11 of them, include Auburn, Clemson, LSU, and a lot of other folks that we play football with. The HBCUs employ roughly 75% African-descended faculty. The PWIs, on the other hand, employ roughly 13% African-descended faculty. So when we start to look at the numbers, this slide indicates the institutional faculty members at both institution types combined. The red line at the top is men at the full professor rank. The gray line at the bottom, well, the colors are over there. The gray line at the bottom would be women at the full professor rank. Clearly, the largest gap is between men and women at the full professor rank. In 1980, there were 2,815 men full professors at the HBCUs and PWIs combined. There were only 223 women at the full professor level. By 2011, there were 3,522 male full professors and only 924 women at the full professor rank at the 24 doctoral granting land grant institutions in the Southeast. Interesting, and these colors are easier to see if you look over here. The men follow the trajectory that you would expect. Male full professors at the top, male associate professors next, as male assistant professors in green. They follow a trajectory that you would expect. For women, the numbers are reversed with the largest number of women being at the assistant professor rank in the light blue and then followed by associate professor and then, of course, women full professors being the lowest numbers. So we use these numbers to conduct a linear forecast and what we discovered is that it's possible that within 20 years, women at the assistant and associate professor rank will catch up in number with men at the assistant and associate professor rank. However, it will take women at the full professor rank more than 80 years to catch up with men at the full professor rank if the numbers continue at the rate that, at which they are, are currently going. When the number of faculty by rank is separated out by institution type, you start to see something a little bit different. On the left, you have uh, the PWIs, the predominantly white, and you can see that um, men full professors, again, the most. It follows the same exact pattern. 
On the right, you see HBCUs, and you notice this clustering at the top right corner. And what that means is that women at the assistant professor level have caught up with the number of men at full associate and assistant. In fact, we, I have the exact numbers, but it's roughly, just for your information, in 2011, 500 people in each category, male full professors, 500 male associate professors, 500 male assistant professors, and 500 female assistant professors at the HBCUs in 2011. Still, the number of women at the associate and full professor rank are the lowest numbers at the HBCUs and the PWIs. In 2011, at the PWIs, only 19.7% of full professors were women. At the HBCUs, 21.9% of full professors were women. Turning to salaries, the most interesting, again, our colors are better over here if you want to look at this one. The first part is the combined institutions. In the middle, you have the HBCUs, and on the left, you have the PWIs. And what you see there is that at the HBCUs, there's a difference between what men and women were paid. It's circled in blue. It remains much, much closer, that gap, than it does at the PWIs on the right. In fact, um, the gap in 2011 at HBCUs was pretty minuscule compared to the fact that at the PWIs, the gender pay gap over the 31 years more than tripled. The first red circle shows 1980, and that was about $5,000. By 2011, men were paid roughly, on average, $20,000 more than women at the predominantly white institutions. The most striking gender pay gap, of course, is across university type. Get this. In 1980, male full professors at PWIs made 41.5% more than female full professors at the HBCUs, which amounted to $10,725 more. By 2011, male full professors at PWIs made an average of a whopping 44.1% more than female full professors at HBCUs, an average of $41,211. And it must be noted that HBCUs do not pay as well as PWIs, and that, in fact, black Americans earn less, on average, than white Americans in nearly every job sector. As the blue circles indicate, women full professors at PWIs also made 4.1% more than male full professors at HBCUs in 1980. And by 2011, women full professors at PWIs made 28.9% more than male full professors at the HBCUs. The trend is very similar at the associate professor rank in which men at PWIs, <coughs> excuse me, made 14.6% more than women associate professors at HBCUs in 1980, with that gap widening to 27.3% by 2011. At the assistant professor rank, though, we see something different happening with the gender wage gap. At HBCUs in 2011, the gender wage gap fell at the assistant professor rank to less than 1%, with men full professors being paid, on average, $531 more than female assistant professors. It must be noted, though, that any difference in pay has a significant impact on the women who earn less money. Salary accrues. It accrues into your benefits. It accrues into your retirement and your Social Security and it continues to have an effect on your life even after you retire. Further research is, of course, needed to discover the reasons behind these inequalities in the number, promotion, and salaries of men and women at the doctoral granting land-grant institutions. For example, why is the gender pay gap growing at the PWIs? Does lower pay at the HBCUs lead to less disparity between the genders? Is the smaller gap at the HBCUs a matter of egalitarianism or simply salary stagnation? Our complete study can be viewed for free on iBooks. If you go to iBooks, you can see the complete study with the linear forecast and so forth by simply searching a gender comparison of HBCUs and PWIs and download it for free. 
a shorter version of this study will be published in the forthcoming first book of the Tuskegee Auburn Women's Leadership Alliance called Outside In, Voices from the Margins. Thank you, and thank you, technology.